So thank you for coming. It is very nice to see you. you are, dear colleagues, dear friends, dear students, a very warm hello, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you for this wonderful event, the seminar of Tubitak Research Institute for Fundamental Sciences. We organize this seminar series relying on the unifying feature of science for humanity with the participation of distinguished speakers of the world. Today we have a very special speaker, a world-class expert in the field, as well as a wonderful person, Professor Anton Kapustin from California Institute of Technology. He is going to give a great talk on topological phases of matter and patterns of quantum entanglement. Anton Kapustin is a Russian-American theoretical physics physicist and the early Anthony Professor of Theoretical Physics at California Institute of Technology. His research interests lie in quantum field theory and string theory, and their application to particle physics and condensed matter theory. Anton Kapustin is a son of famous Russian pianist Nikolai Kapustin. Anton Kapustin obtained his Bachelor of Science degree in physics from Moscow State University in 1993. He received his PhD in physics at the California Institute of Technology in 1997 under the super supervision of John Preskin, the famous scientist in quantum information. Anton Kapustin has made several groundbreaking contributions to dualities and other aspects of quantum field theories, in particular topological field theories and supersymmetric gauge theories. With Edward Witten, he discovered deep connection between the S-duality of supersymmetric gauge theories and the geometric Langlands correspondence. In recent years, he has focused on mathematical structure and classification schemes of topological field theories and symmetry protected topological phases. With this, I want to thank Professor Anton Kapustin once again for joining us and invite him to the stage to begin his talk. Please. I'd like to thank Ali Kram for this very nice introduction. I'm happy to give you a talk here. First time. Good talk. Uh, so uh, today I'm going to give a talk on this topic, which is kind of rather general, and uh, I'm not going to go into any technical details, because if you do, like, well, they're quite, can be quite complicated. Uh, I'd rather want to present some um, sort of bird's eye view of a uh, relation between uh, condensed matter physics and form entanglement. So um, I'll start with something very easy. Something we all learn in elementary school, so, or maybe uh, maybe learn something more advanced. But I learned that there are three uh, phases of matter: uh, solid, liquid, and gas. So that's how we distinguish them. Well, I guess, uh, but maybe also about plasma. But uh, that's what we learn in school. Now, um, so there are three phases, and one can change uh, one phase to another by adjusting temperature or pressure. So that's uh, the familiar picture, and there are many different ways to, um, uh, to, to explain how what happens to, say, some substance that change uh, the parameters. The one traditional one, maybe not the best one, but which we typically find in like, the textbooks is to draw what happens as a function of temperature and pressure. Uh, so so in, in, from this point of view, you have some regions in this plane, like here's a, a case of water, which um, um, separates uh, well, there are internal lines which separate different phases. Um, uh, so there's ice, well, solid phase, there's liquid phase, and then there is a gaseous phase. Um, so uh, as you go from uh, one uh, region of this diagram to another, well, if you, inside this region, various quantities like specific heat or entropy 
per unit volume, they all uh, depend continuously or analytically on parameters, but as you cross uh, <coughs> lines, uh, there's a jump in all these various physical quantities. Um, now, um, sometimes the entropy does not jump, uh, but other quantities still have some sort of singularities. For example, if you look at some another yeah, famous example, uh, uh, helium, uh, transition of helium from a normal phase or high temperature to a superfluid phase. Well, in that case, there's no entropy jump, but uh, there is some sort of singularity of, uh, say, specific heat out of So this is uh, the shape of this uh, curve resembles a Greek letter lambda, so it's all known as a lambda transition. So these kind of transitions are called continuous or second order. Um, so um, actually, this distinction was uh, emphasized by uh, Landau. Landau is only as early as 1937, and he also emphasizes that most phase transitions are associated with a uh, uh, spontaneous symmetry break. And what does it mean? Well, it's a very uh, uh, important concept in physics. Uh, the idea is that, well, if you have some symmetry, microscopic symmetry of the system, there are still different ways this symmetry can be realized. Uh, so, and as one crosses uh, lines in this uh, phase diagram, the way it's symmetry realized can change. And the most famous uh, well, example is a, is a say, mm. transition from a liquid to a crystal. Uh, and you can see from crystal, for example, has a, clearly has special directions in space. So if the crystal has a less rotational symmetry uh, than a liquid, well, actually it has also less translational symmetry, but that's not very obvious. If you stare at it, you need to use uh, some x-rays to see that there is some uh, loss of translational symmetry as you go from liquid to crystal. So, and, and this happens despite the fact that, uh, you know, as far as uh, the energy function of Hamiltonian is concerned, that has to complete the symmetry under rotational translations. But, but the point is simply that when you look at the, uh, well, that stable equilibrium state of a crystal, it does not have, uh, well, that does not have full rotational symmetry. That's called spontaneous symmetry. So this loss of symmetry, again, to reiterate, is not caused by external factors. So the energy function is still invariant under all rotational translations. But stable equilibrium states are not. Uh, and the way the symmetry is broken is uh, coherent across uh, microscopic distances. So people often, often say that this is a uh, uh, the broken symmetry means there's long range order. So some phases in this diagram, in phase diagram, can have uh, long range order or equivalently have broken symmetry, and some only have short range order uh, and, or equivalent that there's no symmetry breaking. And here's a, everybody's uh, favorite example of this phenomenon, uh, the two-dimensional Ising model. So, uh, so here, it's a, essentially a classical model. So uh, you have classical spins, uh, which are uh, take values uh, one or minus one. Uh, and each spin is located on, on a square, well, on a side of a square lattice. Well, that can be, doesn't have to be square, it can be like some higher dimensional lattice, but the most famous is a square two-dimensional. And the energy function, well, this is the simplest version of it, uh, where, you know, it spins <coughs> different sides interact by this pairwise direction. So, so if, uh, say, well, well, so here, yeah, this AB is the edge connecting point in. So this energy function, well, we could also ter add terms with magnetic, magnetic fields, but in this case, there's no, well, I decided not to do it. So this energy function is invariant under symmetry, which flips the sign of all these variable signal. Um, so we have to flip them all simultaneously, otherwise you know, the energy would, would change. Now, um, in this particular case, there's a, we know exactly what, where the phase transition happens. Well, there are two parameters here. Uh, one is obvious here, it's this, uh, the strength of the coupling, called J, and the other one is temperature, but really only the ratio of the two matters. So if you have, um, J is large compared to the uh, critical value of the temperature. Well, if J is large compared to temperature, then uh, these variables are correlated even if uh, the distance in them is far. Uh, so, and, so, um, so, the, so for, for high, um, 
large values of J compared to temperature, you have this uh, strong correlation between this uh, spins of long distances. And if this, you break the symmetry just a tiny bit by boundary conditions, then the average the, uh, or the uh, Gibbs distribution gives a non-zero value for this monetization, well, for the think, variable at some site. And that, that is true even if you take the, this breaking by boundary condition to be to zero. It's still remain on zero. On the other hand, for small j, correlation is exponentially uh, with the distance. And the thermal average of this quantity vanishes regardless of the boundary conditions. So for uh, large j, uh, uh, you know, the energy is relatively minimal and the thermal fluctuations don't do, don't do much. But for small j, a temperature uh, well, is uh, so high that uh, thermal fluctuations destroy the order between the spins. Now, it's not true that uh, all kinds of phase transitions are associated with symmetry breaking. Actually, if you go back to this water, uh, well, this water phase diagram, well, so this, well, this line is associated with the breaking of symmetry, but this line isn't. So, um, and actually, um, uh, there's no sim change of symmetry as you go across this line. And in fact, you can continue from water vapor to water going around like this. Thing. So that's one, another way to say that. It's really the same phase. Uh, or you could say maybe, okay, near, near this line there's a distinction, but it's a local distinction. Globally, there's no distinction between the water and the water vapor. So you can go around this transition. On the other hand, the distinction between ice and water is uh, completely absolute because one has translational symmetry, the other one doesn't. It has less translational symmetry. So, um, so that's a standard um, um, picture. By the way, so we can ask you, what, what, where did this phase transition come from? If it's not from symmetry breaking. Well, it's a dynamical issue. So it comes from the fact that uh, water molecules, they uh, repel at short, dis short distances, but uh, attract at long distances. And one can show that if you, if you somehow manage to switch off the attractions long distances, actually you wouldn't have this, this transition line at all. You just have like one phase, which could hold uh, liquid or gas, but just one phase. So because of the attraction, uh, this line appears. Now, um, so the space transition we discussed so far um, were driven by uh, thermal fluctuations. So a uh, large temperature uh, disorder winds and there's no spontaneous symmetry breaking, so there's only short range order. But for small temperature there's long range order. Um, however, it became clear more recently that there can also be phase transitions at zero temperature. And those are driven by quantum fluctuations. And the interesting thing is that entirely different from, um, uh, well, the, the physics is very, very different from physics of uh, standard or, or familiar thermal phase transitions. Now, uh, well, temperature is, is stuck at zero, but we're still allowed to vary parameters of the, of the Hamiltonian. And uh, so phase transition here appears in the phase diagram where the, you don't have any temperature, just the parameters of the Hamiltonian. So here is a, uh, again, everybody's favorite example of a system exhibiting a quantum phase transition, so-called a, a quantum Ising chain. But it is a nice book on quantum phase transition by such that super such that. Uh, so uh, and there is a prime example. So what's the system here? Well, <coughs> here sort of classical spins, you have a quantum spin. They are called qubits, uh, but it's really just uh, uh, some uh, well, a qubit is simply a system with a two-dimensional Hilbert space. So it's been a half, in other words. And at each side, we have a, a one-dimensional system, so we have a chain of these qubits located at integer points, points with integer coordinates. And uh, on each side, you have observables, which you know like this, x, y, and z with hats, because the operators. Uh, now, they satisfy the usual relation of Pauli matrices, like there's accumulation relations. Um, and uh, also, they all square to 1, all these things, as y and z. And also, for different values of the index a, they all commute. So, the, you know, the observables, uh, think about the algebraic so you have algebra observables, and on each side, just the algebra of power matrices, but uh, if you look at the whole thing, all chain, just the tensor, infinite tensor product. But I should emphasize that uh, when I talk about phase transition, I should really think about infinite systems. 
take the thermodynamic limit. And if, in a finite volume, there's no speaking phase transition. Now, of course, uh, in real life, nothing is infinite, but uh, so all phase transitions are really only approximate, but uh, for all practical purposes, you can imagine that uh, the system is infinite. So then mathematically, it becomes it's easy to treat the system with actually but not easier, but more natural uh, if it's uh, infinite from the start. So you can imagine that this index A here runs over all integers. And the total Hilbert space is roughly the product of on site Hilbert spaces. Now, that's by the way the subtle statement. So, uh, John von Neumann uh, famously wrote a paper on infinite uh, products. And the product explained actually that it doesn't make any sense, the infinite times the product. So, uh, so, we should keep in mind that mathematically that's not what we're supposed to do. Uh, but rather, one should take the tensor product of other uh, algebras or observables over all sides, not all of the Hilbert spaces. But for the purpose of this talk, since we're going to keep things elementary, I'm going to work. Uh, well, yeah, just say it's a product of Hilbert spaces. Okay, here's a Hamiltonian. It's also an operator after what put a hat. And the first term is just like um, the Ising model of Hamiltonian, well, energy function. If you just meant, if we call it z squared to 1, then Eventually, each z can take values of 1 or minus 1. So, so this is just like, just like variable sigma in the previous. Uh, uh, well, before I wrote a two dimensional case, but it's like one dimensional Ising model. Yeah. There's also a second term, though, which does not come into the first one, uh, because it's made of x rather than z. And this you can think of as a magnetic field term. So, in that sort of, imagine so this spins up like to align in the z direction, but the magnetic field is in the x direction. Sometimes people call this transverse magnetic field. So, um, so okay. So, what what's the phase structure of the system? Well, here there are two parameters. The temperature is zero, so h and j. And we know the ratio of this h and j matters. So, um, suppose we fix this j. Uh, and let's take it positive for simplicity. It's positive. It means that um, well, the first term wants the spin, the z projections of spin to be uh, the same for all A, because then the energy is minimal. So if positive J, the system, this term, if it was the only term, would make the system a quantum ferromagnet. So there's all Zs are either plus one or minus one. Now, of course, the second term can interfere with it. But if you imagine that, first of all, if you have small H, then you just think like this term, and then all your Zs are either a binary one or all of them have minus one. So the system is a quantum ferromagnet. Well, on the other hand, if your H is large compared to J, then uh, this term uh, is dominant. So you can just forget about even have the second of this first term and just diagonalize this last term. And the causation is very simple. You just uh, say, well, all your spins must be eigenstates of this X in the poly matrix. So with the minimal possible eigenvalue. So if it's H is positive, then you want an eigenvalue of x to the minus 1 for each of Well, the point is that, um, well, in the, in the, so the simultaneous has a symmetry which flips the sign of all z's, but does not flip x. Well, if you ask what is, how to implement the symmetry, well, <coughs> you just conjugate everything with an infinite product of all x's, right? If you conjugate uh, x with x, you get, you know, you, you get uh, back to x. If you conjugate the z with x, then it flips sign. So your symmetry is simply you know, infinite product of all x's. So that symmetry is there for any values of the parameter in the sense that it's symmetry of Hamiltonian. Conjugating Hamiltonian with this infinite product of x's leaves Hamiltonian invariant. But uh, for small j, the two ground states actually are not invariant under the symmetry. They are rather flipped by the symmetry. And then for large h, uh, the ground state does not break symmetry. Because you have a single ground state which can hold quantum parameter. So, um, well, this example of a quantum phase transition, which occurs at some value of the Hamilton of H, to change from small to large, was kind of boring, because um, quantum paramagnets and quantum paramagnets are different in the same way that the order disordered phases of the two-dimensional Ising model are different. So it seems different because it's a quantum system at zero temperature. But actually, it's the same example, just written in the final language. Uh, so you can actually map one to the other. 
So uh, it's just that um, well, classical 1D Ising model doesn't have a phase transition at positive temperature, but you know, quantum Ising model has a phase transition at zero temperature. Well, the de Ising model has a phase transition at positive temperature. So, uh, they're physically they're distinct, but mathematically they really can be mapped one to another. Now, so this example is uh, boring, but does mean that there are a lot of examples of quantum transitions are equally boring. In fact, there are lots of uh, other quantum phases of matter and phase functions between them, and most of them have nothing to do with uh, spontaneous symmetry. So, uh, whatever Landau said in 1937 actually doesn't apply to them. Uh, and uh, rather, the current viewpoint is that we should forget about uh, the issue of symmetry breaking. Uh, rather, should distinguish uh, phases at zero temperature by the just simply looking, staring at the ground state wave function and looking at how entangled it is. Now, this viewpoint uh, is, is uh, inspired by quantum information uh, and is advocated in this. Uh, not the world book, which came out not too long ago by Shagan Wen and collaborators. Um, so I'll refer to that book for legal discussion. I must say that this, this idea is still not completely, it's not completely clear to what extent it's true, but um, certainly it does provide a new perspective on one of the phases of matter. And by the way, I should forget to say that, um, well, this. Um, this is a rather revolutionary idea because um, when we talk about um, um, phase transitions, typically you start by specifying your Hamiltonian or energy function, but here you are instead just fall to the ground state wave function. And uh, you're not so, you don't need to know what the Hamiltonian is. You, well, imagine if somebody tells you that there is a, a Hamiltonian, but uh, you don't need to know the Hamiltonian to figure out which phase you're in. Well, so you just work with the ground state wave function. That's another tricky uh, as a result because we're not basically supposed to construct some invariants or some sort of signatures on over different phases simply by looking at the wave function. And all wave functions seem to be the same. Well, it's not quite true. So then we not only talk about entanglement. And so what it means to have a pattern of entanglement. Well, um, well, the simplest example of entanglement occurs in a system just made of two pieces. Like the systems A and B. So they're called bipartite systems in quantum information theory. So the Hilbert space is a tensor product uh, of two Hilbert spaces. Now, uh, what it means is that any state vector can be written as a uh, Linear combination of products of basis vectors for H A and B. The coefficients is complex numbers. Now, of course, yeah, you want to, you, know, you want. I'm assuming here. Well, this is assume that these base vectors are uh, normalized, so the norm is one. So, if you want this psi to be normalized, and this sum of squared with number c, it also be, it also be one. So we have this. Uh, so that, that this kind of states are what's called pure states. Right? So the pure states of this composite system. Well, then everybody's a favorite example is the case of uh, just when two qubits. So you take uh, one, you take both uh, H A and H B to be two dimensions. Then basis vectors, there are just two of them for each of them, you know, like this. Uh, and spin up and spin down. Now, uh, well, when I have this bipartite system, you can look at states of, uh, which do have very, uh, which are very classical, like for example this one. Uh, here, let's say A has spin up, B has also spin up, or A has spin up and B has spin up. So this space is just, they're not sums of tensor product, they're just simply product of two basis vectors. So that states are uh, called factorized. But also there are some weird states like this, which are linear combinations uh, of products, not simply products. And such states um, don't really have a good classical counterpart. Uh, so they're called entangled states. And the weird thing about this such state is that even though, well, if somebody tells you, okay, here's my state of a system, 
that's only a description of the state. It's a wave function. So you know everything about the composite system. Because what happens if I measure spin of, uh, let's say, subsystem A or subsystem B? The answer is we have no idea. So some of you know everything about the composite, but you know nothing about each part. So uh, that's what the one entanglement means. So let's say it's called entangled. Well, more generally, if you ask what's entangled state, well, first of all, uh, in general, you, you're supposed to describe a quantum system not by a, a st state vector, by a density matrix. So a positive self adjoint operator on the Hilbert space with unit trace. And then if you ask, well, how do you use it? How do you use it to compute, say, expectation value of some observable? Well, there's a version of the Born rule for that, which they just says, well, take the trace or product, the density matrix, and uh, the observable. So a wave function is a special case of this, because uh, you have a wave function, you can attach to it a, a density matrix and a projector to this the wave vector. But of course, not every density matrix is a projector. There's no reason to put a projector in general. No, it's not a projector, it's set, one says that the state is a, a mixed state. So what I said before, with more precise problem is as follows. So suppose you have this bipart system with bipartite system with this uh, particular wave function. It's a pure state because it's described by a wave function. It's good for the density matrix of the project. But now if you ask what is the uh, density matrix just for a subsystem P, then the density matrix is very simple. It just uh, well, it just identity matrix at perfection. One half is simply because the trace is equal to one. And the other space is two dimension. So, um, okay, so the situation when your density matrix is just proportional to identity, precisely sort of zero, when you have zero information about what the system is doing. So, it's just, just um, what's in before, here in the, in the composite state is completely known. Nevertheless, we have zero information about the subsystem. Uh, in general, uh, what is an entangled state? Well, in general, you say, well, there's some state or composite, and if it doesn't, it's not a tensor product. If it's, density matrix is not a tensor product of density matrix or subsystems, you say the state is entangled. And this entangled states bothered some people, uh, especially Einstein, very much. Uh, so there's a famous paper by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen in 1935. They said, well, these states are so weird that uh, probably quantum mechanics cannot be the fundamental theory of nature. Because it, what kind of stuff is it? How can it be that you have full information about the system, but doesn't make any predictions about subsystem? It just makes no sense. Well, Einstein was wrong there, uh, because uh, quantum entanglement certainly exists. And in fact, I think it has been demonstrated experimentally. In the last year, it was the Nobel Prize for the confirming existence of entangled states. But of course, even, even before, uh, long before this Nobel Prize, we know that quantum mechanics works, so uh, to great accuracy, so we know that uh, uh, entangled states that are real. So, um, so instead of like uh, fighting entanglement, we should put it to good use. And uh, uh, this theory of topological phases of matter puts it to good use by uh, uh, figuring out, well, by determining what sort of different patterns, what are the different patterns of entanglement there are. So, so let's look again at this example of the quantumizing chain and see what sort of, entang what, what sort of entanglement do we, we have here in the ground state. So this philosophy of the Shao Gao Wen advocates is just forget about the whole just look at the ground state. This is something interesting. Okay, so we have two parameters, magnetic field and the coupling. The magnetic field is very large. Well, first of all, the ground state actually could rather tricky to write down in general. But if I take the magnetic field to be like infinite, then it becomes very simple. You just diagonalize the Hamiltonian, uh, and then the, the, your, if you have a unique ground state, looks like this. So just all spins are in the x direction. So that's what we call the unentangled state, or factorized state. Well, it's an infinite product, rather than finite, but still it's a factorized state. Not entangled. Now, that, in the opposite limit, when magnetic field is small, again, if, if, if it's just small, I cannot really write down very 
easily the ground state wave function, but I can if it's literally zero. Then there are two general ground states. One has all spins up, and one has all spins down. Both are, again, unentangled. So, well, the phase transition happens between somehow this state and this or this. Well, we don't see any difference then. So here, uh, you go from unentangled state to unentangled state. Well, and that's because uh, this phase transition is kind of boring one. It's uh, related to some of the Also, another thing which kind of bothersome about this um, is that, uh, well, if you're not strictly at infinite or zero magnetic field, then the ground state is entangled. It's pretty complicated, actually. So, uh, so what do we, well, so on, on one hand it's entangled, on the other hand you would say that, well, infinite or small magnetic field is basically the same for the data. So even though uh, they're not, uh, one state is entangled, the other one isn't, they're sort of the same pattern of entanglement for the data. And similarly for infinite and just very large age, you know, you have a, uh, nothing dramatic ha changes that happens if you change age from infinity to just being very large, but the, the ground state does become entangled somewhat. Now, um, what needs to be done to make precise the statement that wave functions are entangled is, is to sort of loosen the definition of what means to be entangled. It needs some sort of an equivalence relation on different wave functions, which allow you to compare and say, well, these two ground state wave functions, well, they don't look the same, but still the same equivalence class. They're still, let's say, boring entanglement pattern. And, well, this is where quantum information helps, or some ideas at least from quantum information. So this, some, this picture doesn't mean anything. I guess, you know, the two spins somehow entangled. That's what this structure means. I just got it from the internet. So, okay, so what is the, uh, um, the what is, we use a very little uh, quantum information here. First of all, it's uh, called quantum gates. Or, so for, for the logic gates, right, or, or just, uh, devices which take several bits as an input and produce one or more bits as outputs. So these are common <coughs> in engineering, and those are irreversible in general. For example, you have an AND gate, you know, just take, take two bits and get one bit out. That doesn't really uh, happen in quantum information theory. There, uh, you only, uh, you're, you, you assume from the beginning that uh, you have reversible transformations. So if you start with two, two bits or the qubits, you end up with two qubits. So if you start with n qubits, you end up with n qubits. So quantum gate thus is a, some transformation from a state of n qubits uh, to, again, to a final state of also n qubits uh, with some unity transformation. Now some people, well, qubits is a system with two, two states, two-dimensional qubits. What are called qubits? Qubits is just a system with you know, d states, so it's qubits. But in quantum information, people usually just think about qubits. And qubits are regarded as something, uh, some exotic stuff. So, for example, uh, uh, say not gate, when a quantum not gate is simply uh, a transformation which acts on two-dimensional Hilbert space, and this is the matrix of the quantum information. It has one qubit in, one qubit in, one qubit out. So it's a unitary map from Hilbert space from two-dimensional space to itself. On the other hand, control not it acts on a four-dimensional Hilbert space. Uh, why four-dimensional? Well, there are two qubits which come in, you know, the, uh, the control bit and then the information bit of qubit. So two, two come out as well. So in, in the usual way, so control not, you know, you, you have control bit and, and you have uh, information bit and you know, you only, on the output you only have a single bit. But in quantum information, you only have those bits. You know, you know, those two are in them to come out. And in general, there can be some other interesting uh, unitaries which don't have classical counterpoint. So, um, in general, well, you can of course get more complicated cases if we're composing some simple gates. So, and uh, here's an example. You can imagine, say, some chain of uh, qubits, which I denote by this blue line, like, say, each of these little blue things is a qubit. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven qubits come in, and then well, seven should also come out. So there's seven guys here, 
Uh, and we construct some complicated gate on the seven qubits simply by composing simpler gates on just a few, few qubits, say. So in this picture, for example, you only see uh, gates with like one-to-one -one gates and two-to-two -two gates, nothing else. Okay. So, uh, and the original layers. So here's the first layer. So like, uh, in each layer, your gates act only on the, say, so this gate only acts on these two qubits. The next one acts on these two, they don't talk to each other. Uh, and the last one just acts on a single qubit. So then the second layer, which again acts only on uh, gates, acts on, only on one or two qubits, and again they don't talk to each other. And there's also a third layer. So such compositions of different gates are called uh, uh, quantum circuits. Now, uh, the interesting thing about quantum circuits is that, well, first of all, well, we, we can, can entangle different, well, say, so this gate, suppose the original state is just some untangled state, say 0, 1, 1, 0. You apply the, you know, the first gate and it tangles, say, these two bits. So the, the output already has, well, the factor state is going to be now not an entangled state. So if, even if the original one was unentangled, the output is entangled state. Okay. And then you get further entanglement from other layers of the quantum circuit. But if you only find it number of layers, then for example, this qubit gets entangled only with uh, this, uh, so only with this, a few neighboring qubits, say, up to here. This qubit is not entangled with this qubit. So, the, the sort of, when you apply like uh, this form of circuit, well, this sort of a uh, neighbor, neighboring qubit get entangled, but qubits which are far apart not entangled. Well, how far you need to go to get to, again, to unentangled qubits? Well, it depends on how many layers you have. Okay, yeah, like this picture kind of shows this sort of a light pole or entanglement. It's created by each one of the circuit. So, uh, of course, if you allow your gates to be like, like here I only have picture with only, you know, gates which entangle a pair of qubits. So, if you allow like some gates which go all the way across the system, like, like this, then everything is entangled in one step. So, I imagine a situation where you have like either infinite number of qubits or maybe a large or finite one, and then the gates allow, they all have like a small range. One, two, three, but that's it. Or in other words, the range of qubits is fixed and, and small compared to the system size. Then, uh, if I have a few layers, then I get entangled on the entangled on neighboring qubits. But such state is it is called short range entangled. So if you start with a factorized state and apply some quantum circuit, you get something which is entangled, but not very much. So only neighboring qubits get entangled. It's called a short range entangled state. Okay, finally I can give a definition of what it means to be, uh, to have a, uh, to get, to have a, uh, two equivalent patterns of entanglement as far as quantum information is concerned. So two states of qubits are equivalent if they're related by this, by quantum circuit. And finite depth, I mean like, well, just a finite number of layers. The depth of quantum circuit is number of layers. Um, so you have, say, infinite, it makes it precise, I must say that, uh, I must really should consider like some infinite system of qubits and say, well, if two patterns of entanglement of an infinite system of qubits, a equivalent if you can get one from the other by the finite depth quantum circuit. Or if you prefer to work with a finite number of qubits, then, uh, then you should make sure that your uh, depth for the circuit is small compared to the... Uh, well, if, if you allow depth to be as large as the size of the system, then all wave functions can become related in this way, so you don't get, get interesting classification. But if your depth is small compared to the size of the system, then you get interesting decomposition of states of the system different patterns of entanglement, different classes. So for example, a short range entangled state is entangled, but is equivalent to an unentangled state. Let's say it's a trivial pattern of entanglement. <coughs> now from the quantum information point of view, that's what you do. But from the point of view of finance matter, that's not quite the right definition, even though it's in the right direction. For example, if you look at this quantum Ising chain, 
and ask, okay, look at the ground state for different values, even neighboring values of parameters. Do they have the same pattern entanglement from this point, or well, in this sense? Well, not really. <coughs> for example, you can even start with, say, case, like, of intermagnetic field. So, a quantum paramagnet at an intermagnetic field has an un really unentangled ground state. But now it's a change when it feels something smaller, not infinite, but something larger. Well, the wave function becomes entangled. Uh, is it short range entanglement at least? Well, the answer is no. Uh, because, uh, okay, qubits which are far apart are almost not entangled, but they're still entangled a little bit. So entanglement just drops as a function of distance, but it doesn't go to zero beyond some finite range. So that's not uh, quite the right uh, one, the definition. Because we want to say that, well, if I generate a field, unless I cross space transition, I don't change pattern of entanglement. Uh, so, well, but it, one can fix this as follows. Uh, uh, so each unitary in this quantum circuit is really like a discretization of some time evolution. So it's approximately equal to some time order exponential uh, or, uh, or Hamiltonian. Standard dependent Hamiltonian of some sort. Well, where in each, so each uh, u is just uh, like uh, approximately given by this uh, evolution of a small unit. So that's because quantum information people like these discrete things, but uh, a kind of smart person likes uh, continuous things. So we might as well just uh, say, well, the correct thing to look at is this thing, not the product, just approximation, just an approximation of this. And what is this? Well, this is just evolution. Uh, of this ground state wave function by some time, de time dependent Hamiltonian. And what's a Hamiltonian? Well, it's absolutely any Hamiltonian. Any local Hamiltonian. It has nothing to do with the Hamiltonian. Well, when I find the ground state wave function, I solve some problem, I solve Schrodinger equation with some Hamiltonian. That's a different Hamiltonian. That one has physical meaning. This one is absolutely anything. So, um, so uh, let's call such a unitary, which is uh, evolution of Freud with any local finite range Hamiltonian, it's called such a thing a fuzzy quantum circuit. Fuzzy because, uh, well, the quantum circuit leaves far away qubits unentangled, but the fuzzy one turns out, uh, uh, makes, uh, creates an entanglement between far away qubits, but it's very small and they're pretty far away. But it's highly non trivial statement. Uh, well, it's not obvious, that's true. There's something called Lee Robinson bomb. Uh, which is a mathematical expression of this property of a uh, finite time evolution by walk walker This, this uh, theorem was proved in the, in the 60s, I think, but only recently people realized what it actually means. What it means is that entanglement um, is very suppressed if you apply this fuzzy one sort of for all distances. So, so I'm just repeating what I said. When a fuzzy one sort is applied to an unentangled state, the entanglement of faraway qubits is not zero, but it's very small. It actually decays exponentially. And finally, we can give it the right definition of quantum phase. So quantum phase, well, two states are in the same quantum phase, or have the same pattern of entanglement, if they're related by a fuzzy quantum circuit of any kind. That is, by evolution with local Hamiltonian. In particular, a trivial phase or trivial pattern of entanglement is the one you can get uh, uh, from unentangled state by applying this fuzzy quantum circuit. Again, I'm simplifying a little bit. The actual definition actually is a little bit more complicated. Good enough for our purposes here. Okay, so um, now here is a well question. Let's just try to write down some non-trivial ground state wave function with non-trivial pattern of entanglement. Uh, first of all, quantumizing chain is not going to be uh, useful here because actually they, they only get trivial pattern of entanglement. Well, it turns out that if you like, really use this definition, as you said, there aren't any interesting examples. There's a theorem which says that <coughs> if all excitations are gapped, that is, all excitations have energy, which is at least some number delta, the same for all excitations, then the ground state wave function always has a trivial entanglement factor. It's just some statement that in one dimension, this definition doesn't give you anything interesting. So, um, what I've said is that you know, if you look at the states with an energy gap, that is, all the phases are gap, then there's only one phase really, the trivial one. 
Now, in higher dimensions, that's not true. It's a very, very special fact about one dimensional systems. But um, I don't want to go to, uh, yet to higher dimensions. I want to give a simple example. So, what do I do? Uh, well, for example, just, just because of this statement, we get the quantum Isaac chain in a trivial phase. So, that was a, a boring example. But to get something interesting, let's impose some symmetry. Turns out that this theorem ceases to be correct, or this one ceases to be correct if uh, uh, you impose symmetry. So, suppose you have some symmetry action on individual qubits uh, for plane transformation, some symmetry group there, which you call a G. And let's only look at wave functions which invary under the symmetry. Um, then it's natural also to restrict quantum, well, if I want to only work with invariant uh, wave functions, symmetric wave functions, <coughs> I should restrict my quantum gates and my quantum circuits. For example, I should just restrict the circuits which uh, are made of G-invariant quantum gates, the uh, gates which come into the symmetry transformation. Similarly, if I will look at fuzzy quantum circuits, I should really probably restrict to those simultaneously with G-invariant. So this way, I never destroy symmetry when I apply a fuzzy quantum circuit. And once we accept this, we can define a sort of uh, a phase with a symmetry, quantum phase with a symmetry, by saying, well, two G invariant wave functions in the same phase if they're related by a G invariant fuzzy quantum circuit. Um, so, um, so with symmetry, actually, you can get interesting patterns of entanglement. So, this idea that if you combine entanglement with a symmetry, and symmetry gets something non trivial, well, it basically means that you have some. Uh, patterns of entanglement which are non trivial and when, uh, uh, provided they're protected by symmetry, if you impose it. So, hence, they call symmetry protected patterns of entanglement. And here's the simplest example of such a thing. Suppose you have a, uh, on each side uh, a copy of uh, uh, C4, this four dimensional <coughs> space. I think it is a pair of qubits uh, because uh, they're just each of them is C2. So each side can think of it as just a pair of qubits. So here's a picture. So each dot, each each circle, each blue circle is simply a cube. And the side is this like a little, I guess, big snout of the side. So that's just a system. What about the state of a system? Well, um, let's look at some entangled state of two qubits. And I like this one. Um, and let's not like this. It's a state of two qubits, which is entangled. Now, what do we do with it? Well, first of all, we can just say, well, in each, uh, on each side, I just look at create this state. Well, then, of course, the, the whole thing is just tensor product of this state, and this one, and this one, and this one. That's a trivial pattern of entanglement. But let's do something different. Let's entangle not uh, qubits inside each side, but qubits in neighboring sides, like this. So this uh, state was uh, considered first by Affleck, Kennedy, Lee, and Tasaki in 1987. Well, they didn't think about entanglement, but they considered this state. And they explained that this state responds to non trivial form of phase, or in their sense, from entanglement sense. But actually, um, well, what, what can I say now? Well, first of all, um, if you ignore symmetry, then it isn't a trivial phase. Uh, what does it mean? Well, it means that you can disentangle this uh, state by a uh, 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 quantum circuit. You don't even need to go this fuzzy thing to just apply a quantum circuit. You disentangle the state. How? Well, well, we just uh, we can just uh, apply a quantum circuit which they acts on this guy, you know, this guy. The two layer of quantum circuit will disentangle the system completely. It just needs two layers. Turns out, though, that if you impose a rotation group in three dimensional space, well, why in three dimensional space? Well, we have two people, a qubit with a spin, right? So you can think of an actual rotation group on this on spin. So we have two spins, well, you have two spin halves, and the, the, the result decomposes as a, well, a fluid representation of SO2. So, so each side um, uh, has an action of SO3, and actually, this state, this AKLT state, has so three symmetries. It's not it's invariant under arbitrary so three transformations. 
turns out that you cannot disentangle this state by any SO3 invariant quantum circuit, or even SO3 invariant positive quantum circuit. So that's what means that state is a, as a material pattern entanglement. How do we see that? Well, it's not particularly easy, but one hint that something interesting is going on is by looking at the finite segment of this AQLT chain. You see, this uh, qubits are entangled, but the, the two qubits at the end are not. So uh, at the end of a chain, you have a two qubits, one here, one there, uh, which transform a spin representation of SO3. Uh, and this is despite the fact that each side transforms an integral spin representation. This funny situation uh, can be described as follows. So imagine the, our 1D system is a universe. And made of atoms which, with integral SO3 spin. So we're now having a half integral SO3 spin. Now, if we like, imagine living this one the universe, and then suddenly discover we have fourfold degeneracy of the ground state, and it comes from uh, zero, uh, sort of zero energy excitation living at the two ends of this universe. Now, uh, and moreover, we discover that these four uh, states transform as uh, a triplet in the single uh, and the SO3. Now, these two excitations are very hard from each other, because two ends of the universe. So how do they transform under SO3, like each of them separately? Well, the, the two of them together transform as 3 plus 1, but uh, um, since 4 is 2 times 2, each edge must be uh, in, in a spin a half of the So uh, our atoms are only half integral spin, but nevertheless, the edge on the ed edges of the universe, they are half integral spins. And sometimes spin got fractional. So this fractional relation of the spin is uh, similar to fractional charge fractional quantum hole effect. And that's what the, how we know that this, uh, roughly speaking, that this pattern of entanglement is not true because of the edges, you have this funny fractional space. So there's a similar trick uh, which produced by uh, Nedvek Tukayev, uh, which works with fermions. It's even more impressive, uh, even though the idea is the same. So let's start with fermionic qubits. So fermionic qubit has two states just like usual qubit. The difference, though, is that the one state is a uh, both and the other one is a fermion. So say, this is, let's say, a bosonic state, and one is a fermionic state. Uh, so, and then A is, the A dagger is a fermionic creation of fermion to satisfy this relation. So, for each, uh, this is a way to rewrite the fermionic qubit in a different way. When you use linear combinations, this is a Hermitian operator. We set aside this very simple algebra, each square is to one, and then to commute. So that uh, that is called the uh, Majorana fermion. So you can think of a fermionic qubit instead as a Majorana fermion, two, as a pair of Majorana fermions. So it can work on the basis A A dagger or this D1 gamma. So let's know the single Majorana fermion by a single dot. Uh, then uh, a ground state, say zero, it's basically an entangled set of two Majorana fermions. So we can know it like this. The same symbol, but different interpretation. So a ground state is an entangled set of two Majorana fermions. Uh, well, an unentangled state, just a bunch of ground states, will be like, like this. Uh. But what we, if we entangle Majoranas from different sides, like this? So that, that, that gives a state known as uh, Kitaev chain. And that chain has a non-trivial pattern of entanglement. Now with fermions. So this is kind of a remarkable effect because uh, uh, we have this Majorana uh, zero moles at the ends, even though uh, uh, this whole system is made only of qubits, fermionic qubits. So to think of Majorana as a one half of a fermion, zero fermions, but so we managed to create one half fermions out of normal fermions. Now in um, uh, one, I think of a Majorana fermion as a fermion which is its own anti particle. Um, so, as far as I know, there are no elementary Majorana fermions, but somehow one can make uh, non elementary Majorana fermions by fractionalizing the usual fermions. So, um, and that, that is a signature of non trivial entanglement pattern. And people actually have been trying for the last 10 years or more to create such a uh, system in a lab and actually find Majorana fermions. I don't think we've always been achieved it. 
So, um, okay, so that's what I want to say about one dimensional systems, but uh, we should maybe break something in two dimensions. So, here's a, 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 a well, going closer to experiment. So, well, this is what we do, like academic system, which can be realized in the lab. But there's one interesting system which can be realized in the lab, which is a part of the variety of systems of this class called the fraction bottom whole states. So, um, so what, uh, I remind you that uh, uh, you have a system of electrons with very low temperature and a random potential uh, in a strong magnetic field, then the, uh, famously its uh, whole conductance is quantized. There's its sum p squared over h, where h is Planck constant, e is electric charge, times some number, which is some rational number. So when it's integer, it's called integer quantum hole effect. When it's a rational, it's called fractional quantum hole effect. But it's, anyway, this quantization like that. By the way, the system is an insulator because the uh, usual longitudinal conductivity is zero. Well, it's strictly zero temperature. Now, this system has this, this, this system has edge modes which carry electric current even in equilibrium. This is really strange because usually when current flows, you need voltage drop to, to, to push the current flow. But here, there's a current kind of flowing around the edge of the system without any without any voltage. Drop. So the fact that there is funny edge mode suggests that perhaps there's a trivial pattern of entanglement in the system. Um, and it, it actually, it's actually true. Um, uh, if you keep in mind you want symmetry. Um, you want symmetry just kind of relate to relative like charge. But, um, so the system does have a trivial pattern of entanglement, um, even for the case of an uh, integer of polyphony. But how do we see that? So what exactly, how do we detect this problem? Well, let me try to explain how it's done. So, so let's look at this two-dimensional system and let's put it into left and right half planes as well as up and down half planes. So left and right, left and right half plane, and up and down, or top and bottom, or another way to decompose it. Now, um, suppose, well, this can decompose a charge also into left and right of pieces, and also up and down. And suppose you have this ground state wave function of an interdimensional system. How do we extract some, how do we figure out whether it has a trivial or non trivial pattern of entanglement? Well, there's one thing you can do as follows. First, assuming that your state uh, is a ground state of a Hamiltonian and the whole state is a gap. Namely, if you hit your ground state wave function with the right char uh, well, the charge on the right half plane, but you don't get zero, but you get something. You can replace this right charge by just something, which is just leaves on the a line separating left and right half. So why is that? Well, if you act with the charge everywhere, you just annihilate the state and get zero. If you write, but if you write, if you act with the charge which only acts on the right half plane, well, points far away from this um, uh, line don't even know that you didn't act with the whole charge. So whatever you get is on zero only when uh, only close to the this line separating left and right half planes. So there should be some operator, which you call k left right, which lies just on the line. It's not defined uniquely, but uh, should be some some guy like that. Similarly, if you hit your ground state with the, the down part of the charge, the result can be also obtained by acting with some um, uh, operator also lies on the horizontal line in this plane. And then you can ask, okay, what, what else? What do we do with this thing? Well, just take the commutator and then take the average. Uh, remarkably, it turns out that this number is proportional to the whole conductance, but it's obtained from totally different procedures. So, so it's a, like you can take this and one can show that if you state this non trivial pattern entanglement, you only get zero. So now you get something non zero, it only, only happens because your, your ground state has non trivial pattern entanglement. So, the whole states has not have a zero value for it. Okay, so um, I didn't have the time to, um, to well, to uh, explain, well, the, all these examples were had to do with symmetry in some way. There is a way to write down pattern of entanglement which is not, doesn't have any symmetry, but starting in two dimensions, but I won't, I won't show it here. Let me just summarize, uh, first of all, different the quantum phases can be distinguished by the patterns of entanglement of the ground state wave function. And you don't need to know the Hamiltonian. Uh, 
except that it exists. Uh, now, uh, it's kind of tricky, though, to extract the same this information from the just the classic wave function. Well, I can show, for example, in one dimensions, there aren't actually any patterns of rectangle which are non trivial. It's what, it, what, what gets something interesting if we impose this symmetry. Well, for d greater than 1, there are also non trivial patterns of entanglement without any symmetry, but I will show you uh, how they're constructed. Um, and uh, th this fact is a starting point, actually, for topological quantum computation, a scheme for building an HTML for quantum computers. So uh, the, the key word here is, well, is that, that uh, precisely the key, key point precisely is that starting dimension 2, you have this uh, states which have no trivial pattern of entanglement because without any symmetry. And the excitations are weird properties as well allowed you to theoretically build the uh, topological quantum com com computer. Also. So thank you so much for this nice and very deep, intriguing, intriguing talk. Now we can take several questions. Yes? Questions, please. Oh, yes. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, I'm just wondering, just want to ask one question about your last equation. I'm just wondering, because it looks so, it's a beautiful equation, so I'm just like wondering if you can immediately generalize this to 3D topological insulators where you generate the charge at the surfaces and look at the commutators uh, and so on, or would that, would you see? I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure you must have thought of that actually. Yeah, well, so this, um, topological insulators, of which of the non-interacting kind uh, can, of course, uh, be described in a similar way. And there, it's not the right formulas for various indices in the regards of dimensional symmetry class. Now, this formula I wrote is uh, uh, developed so to describe uh, systems with arbitrary strong interactions. And uh, if you uh, ask, uh, well, are there some two-dimensional uh, invariants like that? Well. You need, first of all, to impose symmetry, uh, translational symmetry, otherwise, you don't have any three dimensions. You have a set of. You have to have translational symmetry as well as you want symmetry. Because this system, this applies in the system of disorder, this kind of formula that I wrote down here. But in three dimensions, to get anything non trivial, you need to impose translational symmetry. Uh, that's one thing. Um, and uh, uh, there is a way to do that, but it's an interacting case. Which is rather not trivial, um, and but it's um, it's basically related to properties of, of vortices. Um, it, uh, you, know, you can also interpret this number as saying something about the charge of vortices. Right, exactly. But you can, there's a similar thing uh, in uh, three dimensions. But that would be the missing effect related. To well, it depends on precisely which symmetry class you're talking about. Like in the simplest case of turn so you know, three dimensional turn insulators. Basically, you get charge per. You can imagine that you have a flux tube, and charge per unit length of this flux tube is your is a quantity, and you can describe it, you can give the dimension along the same lines. But for more complicated symmetry classes, uh, it's much trickier because the variants, in general, the variants are not numbers, but some elements of some discrete, some fine groups. So, would it also apply, for instance, to quantum and all effect? There, the charge would be like yeah, it's much trickier for quantum spin hollow effect because whenever you have a numerical invariant, like in a turn insulator, it's easy. Yeah. So whenever you have some element like those Z, 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 then the formulas are much more complicated. More questions, please. Yes. Thank you for this very nice, interesting talk. Um, so first of all, uh, I have. So the, first, so the first one is that uh, to make these things uh, more practical, I think currently this is limited to zero time reaching, but uh, you know, topological phase transitions using some other geometric phase invariants, you can define them at higher time pressures. So uh, is it possible to bring these definitions and ideas to higher time pressures that we still have? Yeah, but I don't know how to go. Well, the thought applies only at zero temperature. Um, and typically we'll say that all these quantum phases become really one of the same phase as, as, as soon as you allow them to be one zero. Because uh, it seems to me this, is, this picture is very nice that uh, when we talk about patterns, uh, I, I think in terms of some graph theory, like uh, 
will have some qubits where we can see entanglement, like uh, some edges between this uh, network. We will make a simple uh, picture in the trivial entanglement with pairwise entanglement. But uh, when you go to more complex patterns, you have long range, uh, like diagonal patterns. So you go from trivial graph to more complete graphs successively. Mm -hmm. So this uh, pattern picture can be understood in terms of graph theory, maybe more sure. Well, I don't know if graph theory is useful here because you kind of, well, the, the, in the high there's some examples of this environmental pattern, they're all they on the theory, really. Okay. So in one, only one dimension of the Because we'll have committed lots to these uh, many but entangled states as you use in the graph theory, and uh, they have found some differences between bulk and edge uh, entanglement, and you can detect them by looking at the graphs. Uh, where he suggested this uh, total entanglement made of entangled ideas for solid state systems. He used uh, this graph theory pictures to detect differences between bulk and boundary. It's very interesting. I don't understand what it was. I may this. Uh, okay. And the last question is that uh, there is also this dynamical phase transitions uh, that uh, we are interested in. And uh, in addition to space, uh, you can look at the time. And uh, I am not very familiar with it, but in, an, in this uh, topological material business, there are some metrics that looks like some analogies to space time metrics in high energy. So, uh, are we missing something here by looking at only in space? But maybe the reason why we don't see these symmetries is the time variable is missing. It's just a philosophical uh, question, but I want to give you an idea. Well, uh, yeah, I'm not sure, but. Uh these issues of time dependence arise against many of the positive temperatures. Then we are just to, for example, some numerical variance for this reason. Well, thermal open conductance, which is a similar, very similar point of this open conductance, requires to work with positive temperature. Um, and then, I guess, uh, you need some sort of that, you know, correlated with time, which is defined. I don't know how to do that, okay? because uh, and the, the, the only reason one can prove such results, for example, to prove that this uh, uh, quantity, if I use it purely in terms of uh, equal time rotation value, uh, and it's kind of surprising, it's impossible to do that, because usually transfer properties like conductance is like given by Kubel formulas, which are involved time time intervals. Uh, some miracles happen to the, to the, at, at zero temperature, and only this one which allows to do that. Already for thermal conductance, all we got is Kubo formula, and there's no known way to write any, even though people believe it's actually it's still positive on very low temperatures, there's no known way to replace it by heat. So some better of a Okay. Yes, please. Uh, I want to ask, is there any difference between the classical pyramid pyramidic phases? Matter for open book. Push. Uh, is there any difference between the classical paramagnetic and par paramagnetic phases and the quantum uh, of these phases? Well, um, um, and the joint question, uh, uh, you said that uh, for the quantum uh, paramagnetic phases, when we take the uh, external field as uh, sufficiently small, uh, we can ignore the uh, transverse field, so uh, we can see the spontaneous matter breaking, uh, but uh, the X operators uh, cannot to map to minus X again. If we ignore the uh, second part of the Hamiltonian, uh, can we can we take the X can go to the minus X again? Oh, okay. I have second question. Uh, so basically, you have a first term which aligns all your spins, and the second one tries to flip them. Uh, you can think of this as a kinetic term. Which the first term is potential, the second one is kinetic. Which, uh, uh, and uh, just yes. when it's small, oh. this kinetic term is uh, negligible, so you just get frozen by the potential term. Yeah, yeah I think that uh, there shouldn't be a big difference uh, to take the uh, x to go to the minus x or x to the x. Well, then we have uh, that particular Hamiltonian has symmetry under z goes to minus z, uh, but doesn't have symmetry under x goes to minus x. So yes, but it is ignorable. 
If if the second term is ignorable, so we can do maybe. Well, it's a, well, usually we sort of if it's literally absent, then the system becomes very simple, becomes just classicalizing model. Because under any other interesting model, it turns off. Okay. The point is simply when it's small. In, the material point is that when it's small, but not zero, the qualitative still get the same results in the classical level. As, as for the first question, yeah, it's very different. Um, well, there are different questions you can ask about um, classical and form of term magnets. So, in specific, well, I recommend this book by Sajidov, which discusses very dynamical behavior for the temperature. So, dynamic behavior, which that, that question that has an interesting answer. In, uh, Case of quantumizing model has no parallel in the case of a, a classical chronic transition. It's just totally different. So you can ask different questions for this model because uh, in a classical transition, there's already dynamics, only statistical mechanics. But here, there's also more dynamical questions because there's a Hamiltonian and the uh, statistical mechanical issue. And the two interact in interesting ways. So yeah. the, the model becomes quite non trivial. Um, yeah, it has a positive transition. Yes, but uh, actually, I want to ask the uh, is there any difference between the, for example, uh, classical ferromagnetic phase and quantum ferromagnetic phase? Well, we're talking about zero dimension, uh, one dimension or two dimension, because uh, these systems are really uh, interesting in one dimension at zero temperature. Mm -hmm. And uh, certain critical exponents, exactly, well, certain questions you can ask about them just map exactly, exactly to questions about classical transitions of two dimensions. But some other questions you can ask about the such systems have no counterpart in the uh, classical case. It's just different questions than ask. So you can think of it as one of the substance of the other. So there's no natural analog for some quick question asking the quantum case. Okay, thank you. More questions? Oh, please. But please. Thank you. Um, I have a question about the quantum ferromagnetic phase just I have one maybe a bit uh, silly question so uh, the index that you wrote to uh, uh, that was equal to by defining two different operators for special uh, configurations uh, so it reminded me of these out of time order correlators for uh, detecting information scrambling or quantum chaos uh, like a special version of, of those uh, operators do they have any Sort of relation, or then uh, maybe a similar uh, like uh, leading way towards the definition. Um, I don't see the similarity. Okay. Yeah. Of course, then the time autops are basically I mean, over time, but this is kind of but the mathematical structure is quite similar. I guess. Well, I don't know. This formula actually is not that mysterious if you think about what what represents physically. So basically, like acting with, you can imagine this operator acting with a charge on the right side corresponds to uh, a gauge transformation uh, on this acting on the side. And then, you act on that side of the system, and then second guy measures the charge which flows through, say, from top to bottom as you do a transformation on the right side. So um, if you think about this precisely, this kind of version of Laplin's argument. Which says that uh, the amount of charge which flows under some flux insertion is the whole conductor. So that's basically uh, why it's so really. So that's the formula that's not that very serious. Well, so I, I don't see how it's related to chaos and how form of chaos. That's yeah. Okay. Then yeah, like, like, curious about the similarity. One more question. So I just want to understand because uh, recently IBM said that they had built this uh, 432 qubit uh, IBM quantum experience quantum computer. With IBM, they had this 433 qubits. So that they claim that they have some quantum supremacy, like 2 to the power of 10, which is n is like 400. So it seems to me that when you have this one dimensional uh, fail chain, you spend all these n sites just to create n time between. To, uh, how do you scale up? So if I go to more complex patterns of entanglement, uh, how can I understand the quantum supremacy and scale the advantages of the systems? Well, I mean, to, 
this 1D systems not terribly useful for the division. So, uh, so for scaling, we need still uh, well, any number of. You really want to create a system where you can put my runners and like, say, listen to the mentions on the chain and move them around. Eventually, you need to do this fusion. Yeah, challenge. so this is not. Uh, well, so, so far, people haven't seen my runners even in this form, very simple form that they just correct. So to apply something useful, you need to do you know, something more, quite a bit more complicated. So the project formulation is not a practical scheme. So far, you just uh, find this file. OK, last questions, please. We can take one more question. Onur, please. Thank you very much for this nice uh, talk. I have two questions, actually. One is uh, related to uh, fermionic qubits. For fermionic mode systems, uh, we have no uh, tensor product. Uh, the state space is not, uh, has not a tensor product structure. Uh, in this case, uh, how, how, does that, how uh, does that affect the uh, framework of quantum circuits and uh, finite depth uh, approach? Well, first of all, uh, yeah, so the, the states, strictly speaking, should work with algebras, not with Hubble space, as I mentioned in the beginning, but with a more mathematically correct statement. Uh, so the, we should say the algebra observable, so a big chain is a tensor product. In usual case, it's a tensor product of algebra of each side. And that part does generalize because uh, if the harmonic case, so you just say, well, we have uh, simply fermionic algebras, which is integrated. And for those who just take the two graded tensor product, that makes perfect sense. So uh, that part actually goes through uh, the problem. Okay. And, and, of algebras of so. and the next question, as far as I understood, the notion of bipartite entanglement uh, is well uh, understood in this context. Uh, can we extend this to uh, multipartite entanglement? Well, I mean, we could try to describe various um, multi-parted entanglement without any constraints at all. Then it's very difficult to do so. So, um, what makes things uh, better if you impose a locality? In one information, which I know nothing about, people consider just a bunch of qubits which entangle in some random, complicated way. So that's very difficult to describe invariance in this general setup. So what makes things uh, manageable here in a smart application because you look at the systems with locality. What it means is that you have a, not just some state of n qubits, but a state which is a ground state of some local Hamiltonian with only gap excitation, but it makes it more manageable. Uh, so say in one dimension, we completely understand now what sort of pattern of can arise. You know? Even though having a number of qubits, and from the information proportion, it would be you know, horrible. Uh, ways to entangle them, but if, if they entangle, if they all have, if they all entangle such ways to uh, make a ground state of a local Hamiltonian, actually it turns out nothing interesting is going to come out. They're very boring. So, yeah. So in higher dimensions, it's much more complicated. But even there, locality buys you a lot. So if you know that you know the wave function, just some random wave function for the ground state of some Hamiltonian, the locality work is you get all the mileage out of it. So that's a how much people you don't have. That's why you get such complicated problems doing algebra. Okay. So, thank you once again so much. For <laughs> All of you for joining us, Professor.